to stage a show based on his cult songs of the 50s and 60s. While he was here, he talked to Michael Billington. His name, Tom Lehrer. In the 1960s, considered the arch-apostle of bawdy batiste and satirical vulgarity. Indeed, the inevitable label, Sick, was attached to his 37 songs, many of which were considered unfit for American radio, and indeed the BBC. But this Harvard mathematics professor acquired a cult following around American nightclubs, concert halls and campuses. And in England, it was considered a sure sign of intellectual maturity to smuggle one of his records into the country and play it at some late-night party. He stopped writing satirically in the later 1960s and retreated once more into academic life. But Lehrer, a spindly and genial man who looks as if he wouldn't harm a fly, came back to London to work on the show called Tom Foolery, though he himself was not appearing in it. The show's a collection of his best-known numbers, played and presented by an English cast. And I asked Lehrer how he reacted when he first heard that his famous numbers were to be anthologized. I was quite amazed. I thought, uh, what a bizarre concept. And I wrote them back and said, well, go ahead if you want to, but uh, it's on your heads. But gradually, as I began to think about it, I got much more enthusiastic. And uh, now, of course, I'm totally enthusiastic. Am I right that you actually started writing songs purely for private amusement for friends and so forth? Definitely. It was for my own amusement originally. And, occasion and I used to write many, many songs that, that were of no interest to anybody else whatsoever. But among them, there would be a few that my friends would enjoy, and so I would sing them at parties, yes. But it was, even when, uh, well, when I was starting to sing them for money, let's say, $10 a night, uh, nobody would, nobody suggested that there was any commercial value in these things. It was just, uh, well, we think they're funny, but of course the people won't. I want to go back to Dixie. It was one of your earlier songs, wasn't it? But can you actually remember the very first? No, I think I was writing songs when I was seven or eight, just little nonsense songs. I just wondered where the impulse to write songs came from. Was it because you were actually steeped in popular music when you were growing up? I was steeped in popular music, and so the original songs were essentially send-ups of popular song types. I mean, who were your musical heroes when you were growing up? What sort of era was it, in fact? Uh, I don't know if the heroes belonged to that era, but I would say Danny Kaye. I used to, laboriously, I used to pick out the tunes from his record on the piano and try and write them down and learn them because they weren't published. And uh, Noel Coward, I would say, of course, and Gilbert and Sullivan. Ah, yes, Gilbert and Sullivan. They were behind your version, weren't they, of the song Chemical Elements. How actually did that song come about? Danny Kaye used to sing a song called The Fifty Russian Composers, which was written by Ira Gershwin and Kurt Weill, and he sang it in Lady in the Dark. And I, when I was very young, carefully memorized it and learned to play it and sing it. And I thought, well, that went over so well at parties that I should find a list of things to do myself. And so I tried the United Nations and the States of the Union and all the various possible lists. And only when I got to the chemical elements did I find a set which actually fit. And uh, they, actually, they fit, as a matter of fact, to a uh, to the Major General song from The Pirates of Penzance by Gilbert and Sullivan. How much were you trying, consciously, though, to sort of push the frontiers a bit further outwards of things you could discuss and, and write songs about? For example, I mean, the masochism tango, which would be a marvelous number, um, which actually <laughs> makes uh, say their masochism funny. I mean, were you so, there consciously, deliberately saying, I'm going to sort of widen the frontiers of song? No, I don't think so. I, I, uh, I don't think I was that conscious or that self-conscious about it. I would listen to songs. In that particular case, there was a song called Kiss of Fire, and uh, this very passionate type of thing, and it just seemed sort of silly. And so I decided to take it to the whole extreme. I mean, this, the songs would say, you know, you, you're torturing me and I'm miserable, but I love you. And so why not go all the way and have it real torture? Mm -hmm. And uh, that sort of thing came about. It is the romantic ballad, the love song, was one of your perennial targets. I mean, you're that, always trying to, yeah. to puncture it and show what it's really like when you're old and grey together. Well, and yeah, so that, forth. Again, that was a little extreme. I look back on something like that now and I think, oh God, how can I, you know, and it's, it's really very mean. In I Hold Your Hand in Mine, you take something, don't you, supposed to be sacrosanct, and then turn it upside down. Okay. That's right. In some cases, as in that, when there was a specific song, there was a song called I Kiss Your Hand, Madame, which was very popular in the 30s. And uh, I was listening to that on the radio one day and thought, oh, wouldn't it be interesting if all he had was the hand? And so naturally, this, I rushed to the piano and dashed off this uh, very simple-minded song. About eight years ago, I wrote some songs for it. American children's television program called The Electric Company, which was produced by the people who did Sesame Street. And it was designed to teach children to read, and they approached me to do 
various songs of this nature, not of the type that I used to write. Usually when people ask me to write a song, they want me to write something exactly of the type that I used to write, and uh, I think that's, that's over, but uh, so it was exciting to do something quite different. You say that's over. Why is it over? I don't know. I have to... Th there are several reasons. One is me, I think. It's probably encroaching senility. Uh, another is the times, which I don't think are funny, uh, as funny as they used to be. I think partly as one gets older, one acquires perspective, which means that you start seeing both sides. Mm -hmm. And once you start to see both sides, then you can't really do anything of the type that I used to do, because you, you can't write a satirical song which is full of on the other hands and howevers. And, but uh, What is striking now, I mean, at this moment, politically, is how we are returning in many ways, it seems to me, to the kind of Cold War atmosphere uh, in which you were writing your songs back in the 50s. That may be, but somehow it was funnier then. Eisenhower was funny, for example. He was universally... Uh, smiled at, at least. And I don't think Carter is funny, and I, don't, and I certainly don't think Mr. Reagan is funny. But presumably your attitudes to certain subjects, like pollution, for example, mm. like the bomb, I presume those haven't changed radically, have they? No, the, but on the other hand, all of those things I've done already, so the problem is to think of something else, and I never was able to do that. Mm -hmm. or at least it didn't, it didn't occur to me in the, as funny, as, as humorous as those things used to. Uh, did actually help to change people's attitudes in America, or was it actually tapping a mood that was already very current and present? I've always regarded that that, that type of song, uh, that type of singing, as preaching to the converted. I really don't see that somebody's going to change his mind by listening to not just a song, but any any sort of satirical thing. I think the the only effect that uh, any sort of humorous comment on public events. I hate to use the word satire because that's mm -hmm. something that somebody uses about you and not that you're supposed to use about yourself because it, so, it takes itself so seriously. Uh, but the, um, the main effect might be a fringe effect. There might be people who would listen to the record in the presence of others or see a performance in the presence of others and hear that all these other people were laughing at something that they regarded as sacred and so they might begin to rethink. But I think that's marginal at best. It's, it's, mo it's mostly the people who already agree and say, oh, right on, yes, you really have caught it, and yes, that's exactly it. Be prepared. That always amused me. Um, that did seem to be an example of really deliberate, calculated outrageousness. In other words, you take one of the sacred American institutions, world institutions, and send it up rotten. Yes, it was a sacred institution to, to, institution to many people, but uh, again, to my small, we happy few liberal consensus group, it wasn't a major issue. It was an obvious source of amusement. And uh, there were certain aspects of the Boy Scouts which annoyed me. And I thought that would be an obvious... Uh, target and the, the title then Be Prepared, which is their motto, lent itself to, the, to being the title of the song. I, in fact, it was confirmed for me uh, several years later. I sang it in a nightclub and this uh, Marine came up afterwards and uh, speaking in his native language, Neanderthal, he said, um, you shouldn't make fun of the Boy Scouts. They're the Marines of tomorrow. And he was perfectly right and it confirmed my point. <laughs> And there was, a, there was definitely a liberal consensus at that time. That's one of the reasons why I think it's, it's harder to write that type of song now, because there isn't that consensus. Don't you think there is today? I mean, I, aren't, aren't Not in America. United on certain no. issues like, I don't know, the Harrisburg disaster or oh, the, yes, the threat yes. of Reagan or whatever it might be? I mean, right. isn't there still some vague consensus? There are, there are some, some things left, but the, the, the more interesting ones, I think, is, is a little trickier. So, uh, and busing, abortion, things like that, women's liberation. There's, there's always, the, on the other hand, uh, even the, the, the true liberals will disagree on these things. Uh, nowadays, anything goes. That's the other problem, is that now uh, you can say any, almost anything on, at some point on television, it's, even if it's late at night, and so that there, there isn't a need for that anymore. Oedipus Rex, of course, is another very well-known song of yours. What was the genesis of that? That's just, a, I guess it was an outrageous idea. See, I don't think that's outrageous anymore. I mean, incest is now talked about in polite company. And so that was a naughty song at the time. You mm -hmm. could sort of giggle and say, oh, I know what he means. But now uh, that sort of thing is out in the open. So I don't know uh, what, what, the, uh, what the effect of that would be now. Uh, it wasn't really inspired by anything except just a desire to be naughty. There are no taboos left, really, are there? Is that what you're that's, saying? That's what I'm saying. That, that, a song like that is just like quaint, because it's uh, like, like many of the double entendre songs that had remotely to do with sex in the 30s and the 40s and so on. You, what's the point of, of tittering behind your fan now? You can come right out and say it. I presume bestiality is about the last, the last taboo still to go, Probably it. it. Yes, I did write a song about that, but I, did you? it's too gross, yes. Could you oh, yeah. give us the biggest no, no, hint of what no, it was no, called? No, no, forget it. <laughs> forget I mentioned it. Smut. 
one of your later songs written for American television, and harking back to the good old days when porn was still something that came in plain brown wrappers. But can I bring up to your present activities? You don't write songs professionally anymore. What do you do now? I lie down as much as possible <laughs> and uh, sit up when, when that's impossible. Half the year I teach at the University of California in Santa Cruz. It's a branch of the University of California. Teaching mathematics? Te I teach two courses. I teach a mathematics course, Applications of Mathematics to Social Science, and don't ask, and a, a course in the American musical. Mm -hmm. It strikes me that a lot of people who are um, have, have, or have been professionally funny, like yourself, spring from a scientific background or a medical background, if you'd like to make that distinction. I mean, I'm thinking of people like Jonathan Miller in mm. England. I thought you were going to bring up Lewis Carroll. Who everybody well, Lewis Carroll is another <laughs> classic Lee example. Carroll. I don't know if it's, the, if it's a connection with science. I think that there is a connection between mathematics and humor. It's a, perhaps a far-fetched one, a tenuous one, but mathematics is the really basically the art of making connections of between different things and, and seeing. That's what I try and do in my mathematics course. It's not so much uh, I can go into the whole uh, propaganda speech here, but I'll, I'll cut it short. It's not so much a, a collection of ways of solving problems, which is usually presented as in school mathematics, but it's a way of making connections and abstracting certain aspects of a situation, which can then be dealt with mathematically and translated back into the real situation. And I think the, that what the humorist has to do is stand back and make connections, unlikely connections. I mean, yes. That's what gets the laugh. It, it somehow it, it makes it to, funnier to me to hear a song when the melody is very sweet and the, and the lyrics are outrageous. Poisoning pigeons in the park. It roused echoes in my mind. I was trying to think of what. And there was a Beatrice Lilly number called I Hate the Spring. Yes, I remember that? Arthur Schwartz, I think. Yes, I, I hate babies. I love <laughs> dogs with rabies, but I hate the spring. That's yes. right. I mean, and same uh, tone, it seems to be, as your number. In other words, you yeah. take something that everyone is supposed to love and reverse Except it. Except that there's a fine line there. In other words, if I had said, we'll go out and poison dogs, it wouldn't be funny. Although I, my, I must say my antipathy to dogs is about equal to that, my antipathy to our Why pigeons. wouldn't that be funny? Basically, people do love dogs, and they, they, would, they would find that offensive. Somehow pigeons, although people may think of them as God's creatures, I think there's basically uh, uh, underlying distaste. Outraged pigeon fanciers did not come up to you in nightclubs? And no, maybe, I don't no. think outraged. I think pigeon fanciers are not the type that would go to nightclubs. <laughs> they're outside of our consensus. Um, can I ask about the second, or the other subject that you teach, which mm -hmm. is the musical? Now, this is what, the history of the American musical? It's not so much the history as, uh, although that's certainly involved, as it is the uh, appreciation of, of what that era was. I regard the, the golden era, I'm not alone in this, as extending roughly from 1942 to 1965, mm -hmm. with exceptions on uh, before and after. How do you teach that subject, though? Every two weeks we do a reading of a musical, of a classical musical. Mm -hmm. You can say that they hold the scripts in their hands and they don't memorize and sing the songs and I accompany them on the piano and a makeshift audience, whoever happens to be uh, wandering by, comes in and sits on the floor and, and watches this one performance. But what would you say are the peaks of the musical? What, which examples would you quote of the great musicals between those years, 42 well, and 65? Uh, it's really hard to pick the particular great ones. I would certainly put uh, Guys and Dolls mm -hmm. and The King and I and Fiddler on the Roof, and Gypsy. West Side I Story? Guess. West Side Story I would include. Uh, that's a little hard to do as a reading. I've never done that because some of these musicals, although they're marvelous, uh, I think would be hard to do just standing up and without the dancing, for example. Cause I mean, when you say reading, what you mean is they have the books in their hands and they you have the books basically move around? Yes, just uh, say the words and dump up into each other. And Does this imply that, from your point of view, the book of a musical is really one of the great sources yes, of strength? Yes, I really feel that. There has to be, in order to make the songs work, uh, the book has to make a certain amount of sense. And it doesn't have to be realistic, certainly. Guys and Dolls is totally unrealistic. But at some level, you have to believe this. And it's, it's very tricky and therefore, to me, a wonderful medium because it is so unrealistic. You, you go right to the theater and there's this man with his hand up waving his stick around while these, all these musicians are playing and suddenly in the middle of a scene for no good reason at all, somebody, or with any luck, for some good reason, somebody will start to sing, which you would never do in real life. I think you know, it, my, my Fair Lady, for example, I, I forgot to mention My Fair Lady. Mm -hmm. That would certainly go on the top yes. four or five. It really is believable at some point. What I like is the musicals that move me at some level, I don't have to burst into tears, but uh, even Guys and Dolls, which is a total cartoon, mm -hmm. uh, is, is moving in a, at a certain level. Why that cut-off point of 1965? What happened uh, to make you stop teaching the subject there? 
Well, I can do it. I do two hours on that. And the, <laughs> the decline of the musical. I don't like to call it the decline because that's very discouraging to people who, who still want to go into it. But I, it's a change anyway. And uh, maybe we're coming out of it. I don't know. It doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, I think a whole a lot of things happen. I'm specifically referring to the American musical. I think that the musicals flourished at a time when there was a wonderful sense of optimism and self-confidence in mm -hmm. America. Uh, that changed in the 60s, definitely, with, with Nixon. But aren't you tempted to extend your course to include someone like Stephen Sondheim, who I thought would be absolutely marvellous to teach because he's so rich and I, so complex? I definitely teach him in the sense of the songs, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I, mean, I think he's the greatest lyricist that there ever was, and that includes everybody. But the... Uh, the shows themselves, I, I uh, I've always feel a little depressed when I when I leave. It's sort of, you know, I get enough of that at home. I don't have to go to the theater to see that. So uh, I don't have I don't have that feeling about it. I think technically it's wonderful and, uh, and brilliant, and I can intellectually admire it. But it's not the same. It, I don't get moved the way I do in something like Guys and Dolls. You seem to lead a very sort of amiable and relaxed life in California, yes, teaching I two subjects obviously very close and dear to your almost heart. Almost comatose, actually. yes. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, do you have um, disturbing feelings about present-day America? Right. But apart from the immediate political choice, I mean by the, by the attitudes of, of young people, by... Do you know, oh, the, oh, yes. Um, sexual permissiveness, the drug culture. It's, I'm not against, certainly not against sexual permissiveness and drugs and all those wonderful things. It's the question of, of what they replace and uh, wh whether they're used, I mean, I'm not, when it starts taking the place of something else. I think the, the times are changing in that respect, at least from what I see, that people are, as the, the economy gets tighter, the students particularly are more concerned with getting jobs mm -hmm. and that may uh, tend to make them work more. I think that personally, the, certainly the use of drugs on the campus where I teach is considerably less than it was 10 years mm -hmm. ago, for example. And I, I'm a, an old-fashioned romantic, so as far as the sexual permissiveness is concerned, I think that it's nice to uh, not to be uh, embarrassed by so many things, but, but on the other hand, uh, wh where, where did love go? You're an old-fashioned romantic. You're the man who helped to puncture old-fashioned romanticism, I thought, in your song. Because, I guess it's because I can reconcile it now by saying that uh, that the old-fashioned romanticism was hypocritical. It, it, it's one, I mean, love is wonderful, but it doesn't mean that because you're in love, that means you're going to be in love 50 years from now. And so that one of the songs was about that. Mm -hmm. And the, the popular songs were so uh, usually saccharine and oversimplified that they were obvious targets. Are you a, um, I read somewhere, in fact, that you were a tap dancer, is that true? <laughs> no, that is, no, uh, <laughs> no, it's not a joke. I, I just decided that, that I should do some sort of exercise, and I've really tried jogging mm -hmm. and all those things, and uh, I find them excruciatingly boring, and t tap dancing was something I always wanted to do. It's an exercise that you can do at any time in the privacy of your own home, and uh, it's a very, uh, it's a lot of fun. I just wondered if inside Tom Lehrer, the mathematician and the lyricist and the performer, there was in fact an old-fashioned song and dance man struggling to get out. Oh, de white de definitely, sail, yes, definitely. Uh, but I just don't think I'm, I would ever be good enough to do that, or I would have the nerve to do that. It'd be some it's, it's very ner it would be very nerve-wracking to get up and do a, a dance routine mm -hmm. somehow. Because I, I, uh, you, you make a mistake, that's the end. And it's like, when I was singing, if I made a mistake, it was all right. And I could cover it. But, and I suppose a, a, a really good tap dancer can cover it too, so the audience doesn't know the difference. But you have to be really good to be able to do that. I just wondered, I mean, from the start, have you always had a sort of fairly equivocal attitude to, to the whole showbiz world you were caught up in? I mean, for example, when, when you were performing in the 60s, you were quoted as saying, I'm sick of my songs, isn't everyone? Guess I'll just count my money and forget about show business. <laughs> Did you believe that? Uh, well, that's for effect, I suppose, for, for the interview. But the, uh, no, I, I'd always planned to retire. I wasn't planning to, I would never at any point that I planned to make a career as a performer. I couldn't really perform, I thought. I'm not a good actor, for example. That is not just false modesty. I'm not a good actor. I would never know what to do with my hands. And those few occasions where I've had to sing a song without playing the piano, I didn't know what, what to do. I just had to put my hands in my pockets. And, and so I'm not a performer by, either by temperament or, I think, by talent, except in this very limited range. And so uh, when people accepted this, particularly in far-off lands like England, uh, I was quite amazed and delighted and certainly was going along with it. But it was never my intention to continue it as a career. I was planning to milk it dry and then quit.